Witnesses say it sounded like an incredible explosion when the fire escape of a Philadelphia apartment building suddenly collapsed and injured three people. NBC10 cameras were there as a friend holds on to one of the victim's hands, who is apparently conscious as the victim is placed into an ambulance by medics. KYWTV reports a man who was critically injured and two women were rushed to local hospitals. Police believe the bolts of the fire escape appear to have been rusted and dislodged from the brick wall of the apartment building. The victims fell more than 30 feet to the ground and now the incident is under investigation. Worth noting, the complex is more than 100 years old and even on Philadelphia's historic registry. Local reporters are all pointing out the city's licenses and inspections department hasn't filed any violations in the past when it comes to the old building, so Sunday's collapse came without warning. Neighbors say the three victims, reportedly all in their 20s, may have been partying on the fire escape landing before the incident. For Newsy, I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn. City might have some other examples here. But this confidence test, you can ask us, we can send us to you in PDF or Word. And you can do whatever you want with it, modify it, add things to it. You can also go, for example, on this one, you go to seattle.gov and you go to their website and they have this confidence test there as a PDF in a Word document. And all you do is you change your name in Word or PDF up here, put your logo there, and boom, you have an industry standard document. It's a confidence test. We call it not a test, we call it an evaluation form because your fire escape is first evaluated. If you remember the code, evaluation, test, or certified. So it's not an inspection, it's not a confidence test. The word test will denote that something got done. No, it's an evaluation before a load test or before certification. So you can get this online right now, or we can send you. For example, a sample that includes this. What this city also did that was unique um, was they also sent out with their tax records, guess what they sent out with a tax bill? A letter that said, hey, the code is this. If you have a building in our city, so everybody got it. If you have a building in our city or anywhere in New Jersey, the code is this and we need a certification. So he basically put the word out using the tax records. It's just another same, so he used that uh, postage to basically bury one of his letters in there. I have an example of the letter. So just some examples of ways to trigger the fire escape examination process. So if you look at this and you read some of the questions, is this an opinion letter? Is an opinion letter with yes, is, can it be considered an opinion letter with yes, no question? Sometimes, they can put a disclaimer still at the end, but when you ask yes, no, did you walk the whole job? Did, is there, no rust in any of the connections. Have you verified the connections into the wall? Did you load test this thing? When you start reading the questions, that's what you're gonna ask. It's gonna make a lot of design professionals nervous. Why? Because they used to get to the top. <coughs> Drive-bys, roll down the windows, not like this, it's power. Collect the check, look at the fire escape and say what? Good. To the best of my information knowledge, belief the fire escape structure sound has been kept painted and hand that to the owner who gives him a five hundred dollar check. He gives it to who? Uh, to you, and you put it in the folder, and you say what? Uh, Next, right? So these yes no questions. So we can send you these, or you can go online. So the one that has this exact one is Seattle. <coughs> okay, but we can give it to the National Fire Escape Association. We would send you the one we made up for, for example, for Jersey City. Their their sample. Send it to your, you know, your legal department at the, the city to make sure everything's cool. But this is an industry standard documentation by another fire department. We also have the Portland, Oregon one. So a lot of a lot of these didn't exist. We created these, and they've been copied in Seattle, Tacoma, Portland, California, um, and any other states that are using any form of inspection. 
They basically copied a lot of these general questions. Now, this is something that we like that Tacoma did, and we made it also part of an option, an optional. This is the Firescape Annual. You guys are going to love this annual one. You have the five year done by design professional, all that's acceptable to the building official. You know who does the annual? The annual is done by the owner, the agent, or other. And you know what that is? That's that yearly inspection you guys walk on some commercial buildings, and you're looking at a fire escape, and you know what you tell the facilities guy then? Who has to hand you the heat? He's the one that fills. He has three questions. Bolts and supports are damaged or rusted? What's he say? No. He goes, paint is in good condition? What's he, what's he going to say? Fast. Fast. He goes, all moving parts, ladder, windows, catwalks, and windows are all operating, so all my doors open, all my windows open. What's he going to say? Fast, and he wants to give you this. When you get there, where do you stand? On the sidewalk. Where does he start? On the roof. And that agent, owner, or other, climbs over the gooseneck, comes down the whole fire escape, activates the ladder or the cantilever, goes all the way down to the ground and hands you what? The, the, the annual checklist. So what's that do for you? What's he just proved? It works. It worked. <laughs> he says, no, you do it. What do you say? Hey, dude, I'm not an owner. I'm not an agent. And I'm not another. But you claim to tell me you know, that everything is good. And it's just three general questions. Every five years, but every year, this is how you, win, you get the owner involved. Don't they do this with some uh, yearly inspections? Um, uh, let me see. Let me see what we can tie this one to. Are your extinguishers all good? What do you do? So you're yearly on the extinguishers and on the uh, batteries? Hey, good. Because when these things go off, guess where you go? Where do you run? When those things go off? Go to the fire escape. You go to the fire escape? So what do I need attached with my yearly sign-off on those? My yearly sign-off on the extinguishers? What do I need? Copy of the, the certification. And then, you know, you have the five-year, but what's, what do you get every year with the, with the extinguisher certification? You get the checklist. Three questions. Bolts, paint, windows. Especially the gooseneck, right? All right. We liked it, and Tacoma came up with this with the yearly. We think it's a great idea. Guys, you guys want to pick uh, a great model to, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel, what's the best thing to do? Use somebody else's. Steal a, steal a wheel from somebody else. So Portland, Oregon has been, we've been working with it for almost 10 years. And you go to Portland uh, Firescape Issues, this is Google. And you can basically copy. They, they talk about everything from the painting to the repairs to the load testing. It's already there. The last class I did, uh, probably in, in uh, October, no, uh, November of this year with them, they had a class. And in the class, there was the fire officials who were sick and tired of seeing me. Because this doesn't take overnight. It's a three to five year movement forward before you get traction on this stuff. But they had. Uh, uh, design professionals that had architects and engineers in the class and vendors because they're the next group you guys are going to have classes with. There's guys who come in and don't follow the rule. One guy wells while another guy does. One guy changes bolt while another guy doesn't change bolt. One engineer eyeballs it when another one walks it through. So you're going to get it first. You're going to write your violation because what do you pull out of your tail whenever you don't like somebody's way of doing things? Load tests. Load tests, right? That'll straighten a lot of guys out. But after a while, this class is really about training and getting a level of, you know, the bar is not even here. The bar is on the ground, buried under dirt. We've got to get the bar here for everybody, for the inspection people, for the repair people, for the painting people. But right now, we're starting with you guys, because until you guys write a violation, what happens? Now, violation writing means you physically see something. So why don't we talk about the first half of this class? What we talk about is going to be the trigger for fire escapes to be attacked. Is it going to be your violation writing? You guys don't walk, you got too many things on your hands right now. You're not going to be all of a sudden stopping everything else you're doing just to go look for fire escapes. 
right? But while you're in that building doing what you normally do, so are you in there for smokes? What comes automatically, even though there's a fire escape in the back? You need to go back there right in violation? Do you? Do you need to go back there and see it? If you've got a smoke, you're there to, you know, that's, you know, write up a smoke detector uh, occupancy, do you need to see the fire escape? Or is he supposed to give you what? What's he supposed to give you? If there isn't one, do you still need to go back there and see whether it's good or bad? Do you care? You don't have to go back there because you're writing about it. If he doesn't give you a copy which says he has taken care of it, that means he hasn't taken care of it. So what are you going to see back there that you haven't seen already? It's a bad fire escape. So do you have to write a violation or are you just, uh, is this a violation or a request for a certification? If you want to call a violation, go ahead. But otherwise, if at the front door and you're doing the smokes and you're going to let them occupy because of the smokes, he goes, oh, my fire escape's in the back. You want to take a look at it. Do you want to be responsible for whether or not that fire escape is certifiable or not? Because what are you asking for? He doesn't have one. So what do you write? What's the next thing you write? Violation. Can you, do you have to go back there to write a violation? No. No, because he doesn't have what? Certification. He doesn't have a certification. I would still go back there. I know. I, I'm just using that to say that it's a trigger. It's an automatic. Because otherwise, during your normal day-to-day -day walking, you're going to write violations that have nothing to do with that building. You're, you're going to be walking some alleyway, see a dangling tread, you're going to write a violation. We're trying to have automatics. And the automatics is when you're doing the smokes, when you're doing the batteries, what else? Smoke alarms? What else will trigger? Permits? You guys got to keep finding all these things that you just want to marry this thing to so that it always comes along with that, and that's the trigger. That on top of that, your normal day-to-day -day operation, if you see something you don't like, you're going to start writing violations too. But that really had no reason why you're in that building. You might have been on this building only to see a fire escape problem here. You would have never gotten to that. But if that building pulls a permit, that building does anything in its future, or goes through any cycle of whether it's rental cycle or sprinkler cycle, it's going to get picked up anyway. So in a matter of two to three years, what are you going to have in the city? Most buildings are going to get covered by something, something tripped it. Something, because you're basically asking for a copy of something to attach to an already good system that you already have. So write a lot of these things down. And the last one I just mentioned today is going to be the tax letter. And a copy is going to show. But again, Portland, Oregon. You go online and you just do, you know, do fire escape uh, code, Portland, Oregon. The whole thing is there, including, guess what? A checklist. So here's another valuation form, and what is it? It's all yes, no's. Any room for opinions? It's all yes, no's. <clears throat> Again, Seattle, Portland, now mandatory that all fire escapes get a tag. This was done with the state, the health of the state of uh, Massachusetts, the, uh, you know, one of the state inspectors. Yeah, help me write, or explain to me how to write a generic Departmental procedures and guidelines. You guys have that in all departments. Building departments and fire departments have what's called departmental procedures and guidelines, which is basically their in house interpretation of what that code really means to you in that city. So that's all we did here. So we can send you this, and you can eliminate all this and put your city's information up here. You can eliminate this and put your, your code down here, or we can do it for you. Yes? The tag that physically goes on the fire escape. Is that a metal tag or paper tag? It's plastic. You, uh, it first starts with uh, plastic, and you handwrite, you know, because it's either a red or a yellow. When it goes to white in Seattle, they want it done on one eighth uh, vinyl. So it's like uh, only <coughs> printing companies can really make those up, but it's a hard tag. In some cities, you guys have a, a tag machine that makes it for some certain pumps and stuff, so you guys can actually have uh, the tags made up any way you want, but. The norm is for Seattle, they want 11 by 17. I want to show you what a tag looks like. Or you can have an eight and a half by 11, seven, seven to 10 feet off the ground, permanently attached to the fire escape. And basically you can read who inspected it and when's the next inspection date. Well, it's white. So if uh, uh, they don't ask for it to be reflective, but when you get there, it's seven to 10 feet permanently attached to the fire escape. In the I'll show you what one looks like. So this is not something that the fire escape company supplies. This is something that the fire. No, the fire escape companies do supply. They oh, okay. have a standard tag at Staples, for example, and the fire escape company would then call the design professional, would then saying it's certified. They would call them and just make up another tag. I'll show you what one looks like. This is what they look like in Seattle. So there's a red one, 
And these are uh, about uh, 11 tall, 17 long. Well, just hang from the stairs. Well, let me, show you, let me show you what it looks like. That's what it looks like. That's a Seattle tag. This is an eight and a half by 11. You know, it's a white tag. It has who inspected it, <coughs> it has the next due date. Clearly red from seven to 10 feet off the ground. You attach it to the fire or you permanently attach it to the building. So now this is the law in Seattle. This is the law in Portland. So you want to, through your, through, your, through your local council, you can basically say, we want all fire escape. Now this is where the best part of it comes in. Over the next three to five years, we're going to examine fire escapes or we're just going to tag them. What's, what's the program that you're starting right now? Are you starting a, an inspection program or a tagging program? No, a tagging program. We're just tagging fire escapes in whatever condition they are. When are they going to fix them? We don't care when they fix them. But for our, the safety of our people, if they're certified, they get a white. If they're not certified, they get a what? Red. A yellow. A yellow. And then if they get a red, what happens? It's a non-occupied building. Because it's got dangling treads, right? So what are you starting? You're starting an inspection program here, or are you starting a tagging program? A little bit of both. Call it a tagging program. Because then, otherwise, you're going to get a lot of blowback. You know what I'm saying? With an inspection program, you, you're, you're basically, there's a tagging program. You want all fire escapes tagged in whatever current condition they are right now. And if they yellows or reds, there's a process to get them prepared, but that's not. We just want to know which ones of them are certified so that my men can get on them safely. And through our other programs that we're working hand in hand with the building department and other issues that we have here with the fire department, Whenever you pull a sprinkler permit, I mean, whenever you bring in a sprinkler test, those fire protection companies bring also along with it a copy of the, that they get from who? From the owner. If the owner doesn't have one, what does that fire protection company do to move the ball along? They hire a design professional to come and do what? An evaluation but it doesn't stop them from continuing forward because they can still submit their, their sprinkler report, but because it has nothing attached to it, what automatically triggers because there was nothing attached to the sprinkler, to the alarm, to the battery, to the whatever examination, the, you know, the extinguishers, what, if you don't have an attached, it triggers a request for one, okay? You guys inspect these on a regular basis, correct? Yeah. Give it a look up. So, we do a lot of these throughout the country. So, um, this is one that I was called in to examine that was in use up to the day that I examined it. And so, you, you guys at some of your some of your training centers, if you examine your fire escape, you're going to freak out because on the inside, you know, it usually have a metal stair, they have all the straw and all the smoke, and you know, you pour water down that poor thing, and what happens to it? What is that? On the outside fire escape, this is me and my hammer test on that. What happened there? Now, you walk up to it, it's already all rusted, indicating what? What suspect? All the connections. So when I was, so they were training on this. For the day I, I examined it. So, please have all your towers examined because they too have not been looked at in how many years? Since the day it was built. Since the day it was built. So, everybody, and a lot of times we'll look at these and we'll make a class out of them. So, you get to examine them for free. And what we do is we basically pick a day that the, it's going to get examined, but everybody shows up and we start looking at it and use it as a, as a training vehicle for you guys, okay? So, Rust, Rust, this is actually um, a veteran's home uh, up on a hill. And if the war didn't kill you, the fire escape will. <laughs> Damage, trucks, service trucks, trash trucks. What do they do? Hit it. They Hit smash it. the hell out of them. Hammer testing, what's it show? How dangerous really it is. It's all false. A lot of these treads that have rust in them are false. Here's a fire escape that we took out of a school, elementary through eighth grade. It was in use till the day we took it out during the, the Christmas holiday. What I did is I kept it because it was buried into the asphalt. And it was, I have a picture of it before and after. 
and I kept it, and I would have brought it here today, but I couldn't get it to, to fit in through my side door. But I usually bring it, in a lot of my classes, I bring the rusty, we call them rusty. And you're gonna see just how thick everything is. So what I did is I took it and I cut it down to make it smaller so we can make it transportable, and we use it as a showpiece in a lot of our classes. And then we, we did everything wrong to it. We welded it back together. We did everything that everybody does normally to show you just what, what, what the wrong things are to do. So a lot of guys on fire escapes, but because EPA doesn't let, would put a clip on top of the tread, weld it up there, and then weld, tack weld onto all, all the grating. You've seen many of those. Can't be done anymore. No welding on fire escapes. From underneath, a lot of times when you got a lot of rust here, what they do is they weld the nose. Just weld the nose. Leave the rust in there, weld the nose. That's what a square head bolt looks like. Why? Because nobody knows what the right way to do it is anyway. So welding becomes the fix it. No welding on a fire escape because it has lead. 98% of all fire escapes in the United States are bolted. How do you fix a fire escape? With a weld or a bolt? With a bolt. You go anywhere and you have a weld, what do you want? To prove what assurance do you get? X-ray. X-ray or load test. So what's cheaper? If I have a weld anywhere, pop a bolt. Keep your weld. If the weld is in good condition, pop a bolt. Do I need to X-ray or load test that weld? What's cheaper? X-ray load testing or a, a 25 cent bolt? Got it? So it's not that welding's no good. It's that it has to be X-ray or load tested every five years mandatory. As soon as you bolt it, how long before you load test it again? That welded that weld with a bolt now, 25 years. So this is common. This is what the thing looked like when we, when we cut it down with all the lead on it and everything. So we use it as a showpiece. And this is what it looked like before. So kindergarten kids came to the re this fed the recess yard. Kindergarten kids and teachers every day. You know who made me change this up? The custodian. Not the fire official who's been looking at this thing for the past 25 years. Not the building official who walked the same fire escape for 25 years. Not the principal of the place. The custodian said, dude, you got to change this. This is going to hurt or kill somebody. And we did. So it now it comes out, that door goes to the, to the right. It comes out, goes to the right along the wall. No longer goes into the, the kids. Plenty of lead, you know, so you can, in case you don't have enough lead that day, all the little kids can get a little bit of a chip at a time. Okay? So, you walk up to a fire escape, it's fully rusted. How long has it been rusting? 25 years. It started where? Outside, and now, it, now it's eating the, the, the connections, or it started in the connections, and now it's eating the rest of its paint? And the connections. Do you guys, when you look at fire escapes from the, from the sidewalk or from a window, do you get on it anymore? And, the, and if you are gonna get on it, you wanna prove a point, you bring your three pound hammer and you do what? For your own safety and protection? Ping pong ping test. Pong. The ping pong test. And you do this. Okay. Right? I think that's it. Some people say, hey, you know, that's the hammer doing that. I'll give you a tread with two three eighths bolts. I'll give you that hammer. And I said, shear those, those bolts for me. You'll destroy the tread before you shear those bolts. Okay, so this is not all, oh, it's the guy. It's not. Have you used certain bolts? Stainless, galvanized? No. As a matter of fact, that's a very good question. Uh, everybody thinks, oh, you know, if you use a better bolt, what destroys a bolt is that when they were first put together, they were like this. Rust, a 16th growth, an eighth growth, a quarter to rust does this to the two members of steel. The shaft that was between the two now gets pulled apart. <coughs> So whether you have a, a regular bolt, a stainless bolt, a gold bolt, a titanium bolt, and you exert what's called rust jacking or ice jacking, does it matter what kind of steel you're using? So it's all about connection management. As soon as you fix any of these connections and you separate it and clean it, prime it, you're supposed to inject it with 50 year silicone. So when you put it back and you put that standard bolt or even a, a wood dowel in there, right? The, the dowel is keeping it from doing what? Shearing, right? So it's not really anything about the bolt. Some people say, oh, you got, I want stainless back in there. It's not. You got to stop the connection from ever growing again and tearing the bolt apart. So as soon as that, and you got silicone in there, 
can rust ever grow <coughs> between two members of steel? You got silicone in there. So it's all about connection management with none of these. That we're done. Rutgers University. This is the only fire escape <laughs> with a fireman's pole. Not just one, two, on one of their buildings. So this is a fireman pole fire escape. Still there. It'd be great if this was a fraternity, because that's the. Uh... Okay, anybody ever see a slidescape? No? Elizabeth, New Jersey has the only slidescape, to my knowledge, 12 story, in the center of town. I have a picture of it here to show you guys. A slidescape, you jump in, you corkscrew all the way down on a on 1900, 1905 building. Elizabeth, New Jersey. So you gotta remember this, right? Mm -hmm. And this was the bridge pour, right? One of the keys, this is an eight-year-old girl. How many of you have taught your eight-year-old daughter how to climb down a fire escape ladder? When it's working, imagine trying to teach her when it's not working. And then she's 12 feet off the ground and the fireman below telling her to do what? Jump. Jump. And she's gonna do what? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. But right now, everybody, we're taking down you the You guys remember the story. But 50 the people were on the fire were escape. Coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters today okay. one of the scarier moments. Our situation building, happened in 2000, in, in 1973. The hanging off the side uh, of the second fire later, he grabbed the ladder, saved himself, but he couldn't grab. The girl, the woman tried to grab, and the little girl, and they all felt, but the woman died. <clears throat> the Philadelphia collapse happened. Why? The bolts rotted out. How it was tied into the building, rotted out. Those bolts into the building can hold uh, 100 pounds per square foot. So can you have three kids on a birthday party having a smoke on a fire escape that's properly maintained? Can you bring the whole party out there and try to fit them all on the fire escape and it'll stay? And I mean the whole party, because you only got so much room, right? It's a four by four. There's 25 people in the party, you're not gonna, unless they get on each other's shoulders. But even if they get on their shoulders, will that fire escape come down? A properly maintained fire escape will never come down because you can't load it with more than it was designed for because it's physically impossible. If they said, oh, the load is 50 per square foot, then there could be a point where you've got too many people on it. They took that number and they doubled it. So that's why firemen 50 years ago were very safe on fire escape because they believed in what was underneath their feet. When you build a room, some rooms are 40 uh, pounds per square foot, some rooms are 60 pounds per square foot, some decks, what's the deck load? Outside decks. I think they're 60 to 80, and that will determine whether you're gonna get a two by eight, or a two by 10, or a two by 12. Fire escapes are 100, okay? So you got rooms in your house that the, the floor joists are take less load in a room. And you know how many parties you've had inside of a room? So a fire escape is a hundred. But you don't maintain it, guess what? It's gonna drop people to the ground. And primarily because of the attachment. There's another building that we took apart, and what's the problem here? Now, like I said, we don't have to investigate. We don't have to spend thousands at all to opening up bricks to find out. We're gonna see the rusty tears on the outside. Do we fix this stuff or we let sleeping dogs lie? Fix it. Fix it. Lie. And then what do we what do we put next to it? Duplication. Three quarter hardened steel rod, threaded rod, with a plate on the inside, a nut on the outside, and then that mechanically fastens back to the rotted piece of something because we pick it up not inside here, we pick it up outside here. And what's that do? That negates what's here, because I don't want to see that. I don't care. Because you open up a can of worms, what happens? You got a mess. You got, a, you got a, other messes. This is what a hole looks like. See that right there? In order for me to investigate this with one of the little probes and a camera, I have to drill two, three, four, three quarter holes so I can stick my face in there. Why not just take that and put a single hole over there, six inches away, put a plate on the inside or an epoxy bowl. So sometimes it's a masonry at the right time. You can actually do masonry. You can do epoxy, healthy epoxy bolts. So you don't have to go through and damage the inside. So it's healthies and or, um, uh, through the plate. But I'd rather do this once than drill it and verify it. This is the verification process. Very time consuming and destructive. 
That's what it looks like when you stick your face in it, trying to look in. Yeah. What, what do you see? These are through bolts on the inside, plates on masonry. The majority of the times, the through bolt for the plate on the inside is wood. We just had a conversation with somebody in here. Lag screws. You get to a fire escape and there's a lag screw into a wood structure, it's illegal. All wood structures have a through bolt and a plate on the inside. If you see, one of the giveaways is that you only need one through bolt to hold a platform in the air. If you see two, three, four lag screws <coughs> on one support, it's illegal, meaning somebody, you know, uh, lag screwed it into the building because they didn't know the, the proper technique of, a, of, a, of attachment. Load testing, three ways to load test. Sandbags, water bags, or cables. So you can actually put the weight at the very bottom, such as a truck, and you can cable, this is us in California, cabling all the way through. So we're down below lifting, and we're lifting 3,000 pounds and exerting 3,000 pounds of force. So now you have to run cables, and you have to spread the load, and now we're lifting the tail end of this truck. Okay, here's another low test. We performed this for one of Harvard's buildings. We purposely picked this small residential uh, fire escape and left some bolts behind because we wanted to purposely have a load test and not charge Harvard for it. We just said, I, want, I need to document it. So here's a load test where 50 pound sandbags get dragged up by many men. And what do you do? Lay them down. It's almost like what straw is going to break the camel's back? You know how dangerous this is? Because you're supposed to have, you know, machine off to the side. You're supposed to have all kinds of, sometimes you sh there's no room. There's no room for a lift. There's no room for a chair to pick up. There's nothing. And what do you have to do? Otherwise, I just change the bolt. What don't I do? Oh, no low test. Look, look at all those bags. It's great. Look at that. Look how crazy this is. From 7 in the morning until 7 at night, this team, and it was a total of seven guys to low test this baby fire escape. Because it's 30 minutes to an hour. And here's the thing, when you load test, it's 40% of the load, so 1,000 pounds is going on that. So I have to put 400 pounds, measure before, measure it after. Measure before, during, and after. And then once, you, once we've done a certain amount of time based on the engineer's uh, criteria, we then load the remaining 60% for either a half hour or an hour. So, so you've got multiple things going on at different times, and you've got stopwatches, and, you know, and, and it's, it's just insane. Why? The amount of money you spend on all this, on seven guys for 12 hours, how many bolts can you change with that? Right? So is this a low test class or is this a other evidence of strength class? And, what, and when should they have changed this anyway? When is the normal cycle for a fire escape to be revolted? 25 to 50 years, which was how many years ago? 25 to 50 years ago, that's when this would be done. So you're asking somebody on a, with a 75-year-old grandma, what are you saying to him? Stop loading her. What does she need? Bolt, transplant, pacemaker. She's, she needs to be rebuilt because she won't take it. So now we're loading onto a, a stair. We're doing a concentrated load. A baby on a tread, 200 pounds. So Tom, you, you want to note that the staircase is starting? What time? Six. Start time, drop time, 30% load, 100% load. Just keep doing it. It's a pain. But we recorded it because some people want to say, what's a load test? That's a load test. Can it be done? Yeah. So if somebody wants to be, well, there's, I can't find anybody to load test my fire seat. Can you find people to load test fire seat? He's quicker going to find just how much low test costs. The average low test fee per floor could be three to five thousand dollars. Low testing fees. Repeat that one more time. The fees. Uh, low testing fees. The whole setup three to five thousand per floor. So if he has a five story, it could be a ten to fifteen thousand dollar day, two days. And sometimes you guys want to witness it. Otherwise, what can you use that ten to fifteen thousand dollars to do? Rebuild, change bolt and, and slap paint on it, right? So is this a low test class, <laughs> class or a refurbishment class? Refurbishment. Refurbishment. That's the other evidence of strength, right? Depending on the structural condition, a low test may be ordered. That's all you have to remember about your test. So it must be maintained at all times. 
That's just code all over New Jersey, right? Must maintain it all the time. So if you see a rusty fire escape, what do you write? Mm -hmm. And your violations always states, examine. That's the examination. So inspect it, repair it, and the last word you use, test it. Test. Now they're gonna ask you, somebody's gonna call you back and say, whether it's the owner or the engineer, they're gonna say, what do you mean by test? You can always say to the engineer, say, well, what do you think it means by test? He goes, you want me to order a low test? That's your, that's your method. Otherwise, do you have other evidence of strength? And if he goes, what do you mean by other evidence of strength? What's this guy telling you? Does he know what he's doing? No. Can you just send him to the YouTube and say, hey, listen, type in on YouTube, fire escape seminar, Passaic, and what's he gonna get? This class. Quote from the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> so that, this, this, this is what we're here, you know. So you can always educate the engineer or the vendor by basically saying, hey, just go online, type in Farscape Seminar, watch the class that I had to watch so I could know more than you. <laughs> and I'm not supposed to know more than you. But by the way, guess what I have in my back pocket? What do you guys have in your back pocket? We'll scare the shit out of everybody. The con part. Load tester. Con. Got it? You have anything else in that back pocket, oh aren't you? Yeah, when, whenever you deal with anybody that's just, you know, giving you a hard time about a fire escape, what do you always pull out? They spot repair any fire escape. What are they automatically triggering? Without you, you have to pull it out. Load. Load test. Why? Because what are they leaving behind? Original hardware. 50 to 75 year old original hardware, which is square head bolts and rivets. And the, what about the connections into the wall? Do they bring their X-ray Superman vision? So the so you need assurance. So they want to change some bolts, but they want to give you an opinion on the remaining bolts. So what do you tell them? Load test the remaining bolts. Or since you're there anyway, change them out. You've met how many codes? You're gonna meet OSHA. You're gonna meet International Fire Code, International Building Code. You're gonna meet. You're gonna satisfy your maintenance code. You're gonna satisfy New Jersey Code of. You must maintain everything on your building. What? Right. Everything on your building must be maintained at all times in operational condition, right? That's what it says. But don't forget, if you really play the social card correctly, you're going to have a lot less resistance because when does it come into play? When somebody's altering about putting siding on a building, what's that siding guy need to pull that permit? A certification on the... Why? Because what's he going to use to put the siding up? His ladders and the fire escape. A window guy is pulling a permit because he's changing all the windows out. What's he going to use? The ladders and the fire A roofing guy, like the guy in Colorado Springs, is going to get on the roof of this building. <coughs> and he's going to use what? Because that's OSHA. Right? Anytime you repair, repair or alter a building, you're supposed to certify or provide alternative means of egress. So that guy in Chicago, the owner of the building, in 50 years, has he done some activity in there? Has he pulled some permits? And so that would have triggered the OSHA requirement. So you guys got, if you guys play this correctly between all the automatic triggers that we just talked about and the OSHA part, you can sort of really put this to the front of the line. And who's paying for it? The owner, he's already doing something. He's already spending ten, thirty, fifty thousand dollars anyway, new bathrooms or new roof, doing something. And what's gonna happen is the guys who are going to go there to work, they're going to use what? Fire escape. And if they use the fire escape that was just certified last week and vendors to change windows, work on the roof, use the fire escape, but that fire escape is still certified after they used it. They used it. Do you know what they did to it? So after they use it, what, it must, what must be done to it? Certified. Must be certified, recertified at the cost of who now? The owner. The vendor. Because he used it. Because as soon as you set up a fire escape and you set up all the locks and you set it up, so as soon as I get this sprinkler system all set up and I'm the fire protection company, somebody else comes in and says, hey, 
we need a garden hose in here. I, I got this trick where I take one of the heads off and I connect the garden hose and I wash this place down and I put the head back on. What, what have I just done? I've altered it and that needs to be what? So any vendor that uses a fire escape, okay, and we went through this, any vendor that uses the fire escape does what to the certification? Alter it, alters it. So can he use the fire escape? Yes. Knowing that he's altering it, you know, not altering it, knowing that he has to recertify it at the end of its use? Yes. It's when they use it and then they don't recertify it because they either overload it with bricks or they do stuff to it. What happens? Does that happen once? Share that case with you. This is the fireman case. A startling scene in downtown Colorado Springs Wednesday after a man falls to his death. I was just walking up the street to get to the bus stop and the cops were right there told me I couldn't come this way. Police say the victim and several others were working on the roof of this privately owned building when the man fell. He may have fallen um, a distance of anywhere from 15 to 20 feet is what's being investigated right now. Tragically, the man died on scene. It's believed he fell from the fire escape and not the roof or a window, although how it happened is still unknown. That's what's being investigated right now to determine the actual cause of the accident itself. Right now, police say the death is not criminal and is being called an industrial accident. There were several witnesses, individuals who were working with the, uh, the deceased party, um, and so we've interviewed them as witnesses in this investigation. It's really sad. I feel bad for his family. I mean, I don't know him, but prayers and best wishes to his family for sure. Others in the area expressing similar concerns and well wishes visibly distraught by the day's events. I mean I can't even imagine it just coming out to do your job one day and just fall off a building like it's really sad. The smoke, the flames and the frightened faces all in a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night it wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Oh, I was scared to death. <laughs> but the fire escape that broke underneath him. Where the railing just came away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts, more unsafe fire escapes. Rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken. And what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron worker is licensed to build, maintain, and inspect fire escapes. So then over here. For months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, at apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the Correct. fire escape. Correct. And the bottom line? It'll get weak and then eventually it'll fall. This one has rotted connections. This one missing bolts, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, never come down. This one a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody at a in a cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files, but there's no fire escape certification. Not in this file. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. But there's no certification in this one either. Right. Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe? Or not? Well, I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, no. four more fire escapes. Did it fall through the cracks? Yeah. Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. I, How can they get away with that? Be, I guess that the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us on camera about this? No. But when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said it's a cold day in hell when that happens.
In Cambridge, too, not one of our test buildings was certified, and the official in charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, where there are more than 8,000 fire escapes, again, according to inspectional services, not one we checked was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation when you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, it'll be too late to learn you've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Phillippe Ryan.